more about um, about hunter gatherer subsistence models for hunter gatherer sub subsistence. Uh, there's some modifications of the diagram model to take into account some unique um, facets of human uh, foraging. Uh, and we, we mentioned a couple of these uh, yesterday. Uh, one is, is that humans have a division of, of labor. And in that division of labor, it's normally for hunter gatherers uh, that men are hunting large game and women, women are not. And we, we'll talk about that later on. Is that, is that true? Uh, the, the answer is yes. Um, and are there some reasons for it? And I, I, yes, there, is, there are some reasons uh, for it as, as well. Um, but the uh, accepting that as, as a given, men hunt large game, women, women don't, then the effective environment for men and women is, is different. And that means they'll have different diet breaths. That doesn't mean that like I said yesterday, it doesn't mean that women are eating something different than men. It, it simply means that when they go out foraging, they'll be looking for very different things. Uh, so if we uh, consider this, the model we looked at uh, yesterday, for uh, women, if we imagine that resource A is, is large game, for, for women, large game doesn't exist. Even if they find the tracks, they may go home and tell their husbands or their brothers that they saw tracks of an animal, very recent tracks, and that certainly happens, but they're not going to follow it. The resource doesn't exist. So what does that mean? From the diet breath model, what does that mean? What does that tell us about the resources women are going to take? Well, they're operating in an environment where this resource really doesn't exist, it's as if it's gone. So they're, they're going to be taking a lower range resources and a broader range of foods than men would be, would, would be taking. Men will focus on those high range resources. Women are going to take a broader range of, of foods. Uh, and they'll be operating at a lower overall return rate than, than men would be operating that as, as well. Uh, children. Children, uh, their, their choices of what they can forage for um, is affected by a, a number of, of things. Uh, one of them is skill. You need a certain amount of skill to collect some food resources. Some are easy to collect, berries. Children can collect berries. Um, but going hunting after a large game, that may take a long amount of time. It requires a lot of experience and skill and reading tracks and reading sign and knowing how to approach an animal, understanding how the winds work, which animals smell well, which animals don't smell very, very, very well. You need all that information in order to hunt uh, successfully. So skill is going to uh, play a, a role in it. Le leaving that aside, um, the, the, the choices that they make are going to be affected by their, their size, but not so much by their size, but by their walking speed. But their walking speed, of course, is a function of their size. Children are small, usually, and they have short legs which means they don't walk very fast. They don't walk as fast as adults, certainly. So if they don't walk very fast, again, think about it in terms of this, of this model. If they don't walk very fast, are they going to encounter high-ranked resources more or less frequently? Less, less frequently. So, this may be an adult encounters resource A in 30 minutes, but it may take a child 40 minutes, 50 minutes, 60 minutes. It depends. 
So that, that means for children, it's as if these read these high ranked resources are rare on the landscape because it takes them longer to encounter them. If they're rare on the landscape, then we can imagine that children are operating more in this area here, which means they're also going to take lower ranked food resources and perhaps a broader range, but it will depend on which of those resources require skill. Some of those, uh, those foods uh, it may take them longer to uh, acquire, and so they'll have a higher post-encounter return. I'm sorry, they'll have a lower post-encounter return because it will take them more time to get those foods. Uh, think back to the Nikea and foraging for tubers. I showed you some pictures of, of a Nikea man digging for tubers. Those tubers occur about 75 centimeters in the ground, which is about an adult. That's the distance from here to here, which means they can get those tubers by digging down, and eventually they reach all the way down into the ground, pull the tuber out like that. How long is the arm of a small child? Not that long. It's short. So what's that child going to have to do? More work. They have to dig a bigger hole. Basically, they have to dig a hole about this big because they're going to go down there with the entire bodies and burrow down into the ground to get that tuber out. They can't reach the big ones. So sometimes children, when the tubers are young, they occur not so deep in the ground. So children go after small tubers that are not so deep. But if they go after deeper ones, they have to dig a, a bigger hole, and that takes more time. So they have a lower <coughs> post encounter return. So that all of their, many of their foods, it depends on the characteristics of the food, but some of their foods will have a post encounter return rate that's even lower than what we might calculate for uh, adults. So if, if we want to think about children's foraging, and children's foraging is important, and we talk about that um, probably tomorrow or tomorrow, I think. Um, if we want to model children's foraging, we can't use adult data. We need the, the children's data. We need information on, on children. Children also are children. So if you go out foraging with them, they uh, they play. They don't work very seriously. Adults may work seriously at digging tubers. The Nikea kids that I saw digging tubers, um, they dig down into the ground. They dig down deep into the ground so their bottom is sticking up in the air. Someone else will pull their, their cloth up wrap it around and then snap the bottoms their children. Sometimes they dig tubers up out of the ground, break them into pieces, and have fights throwing tubers around. So they're children. They have lower return rate. Uh, what I want to talk about uh, mostly at this point is this, this fact. Uh, Hunter-gatherers are what ecologists would call a central place for, for foragers. Many animals, they go out, they wake up in the morning, they go out to eat, or they wake up at night and go out to, to eat. And they find something to eat, and they eat it. And then they move on. They find something to eat, they eat it, and they move on. They don't collect food and bring it back to one location. But that's, of course, what humans do. They don't feed as they go, and they eat a little bit, but mostly they're collecting food to bring back to their, to their camp. And they're bringing it back to the camp, 
to share with the family, to share with other people, uh, or to spend time doing the processing on the, the, the resource. This is important for archaeology because it affects what it is that those foragers bring back and leave in the camp, and what they leave out there in the places where they've hunted animals or gathered, gathered plants. So it, it, it has a real effect on what, what is left in archaeological sites for us to find. Uh, and this can become important <laughs> in terms of de determining what it was that people were, were eating. But that is, if we have an archaeological site, we've excavated it, we find some bones, some seeds, some shells, uh, we use that to then reconstruct what people were eating. But what if people were eating foods that leave nothing behind? And leave nothing behind because the, the residue, the garbage that could be left behind is not left behind in a residential site, but is left in some more difficult to find location on the, on the landscape. Just an as an example, shellfish. Studies have shown that shellfish, if you're going to go collect shellfish, it's, it's almost never worth carrying the shell back to camp. Even if the camp is only um, 100 meters away, people will still take the meat out of the shellfish, put that into a container, throw the shell away, and then take the, the shellfish meat back to the site. They eat it. They leave nothing at the site. There's no shell left at the site. All the shells may be left at the coast. They may be left in the, in the water. Archaeologists certainly can find a few shell middens but that's not where the people were actually living. If you excavated the site where they were eating the shellfish, you would probably find no shell. That's just, that's just one, one example. So we need to um, take this into a, account. Uh, now we have to take it into account uh, in a couple of, of ways. Uh, one is is that we, we have to take travel time into account. Time that a hunter-gatherer will spend traveling from their camp out to where they're going to start searching and foraging for, for food. That may be completely wasted time. There's nothing that they do in that time except move from the camp out to where they're going to forage. And as that distance gets longer and longer, their overall foraging return rate will get lower and, and lower. And we'll actually see that in a working um, in the second half of, of today's uh, talk. Uh, the, the other thing we have to take into account is that since hunter-gatherers are not feeding as they go, they're simply collecting food and then bringing it back to, to camp. Those, th those are a couple of questions here. What, one is that we, we have to decide what, what the appropriate post-encounter return rate is. And we have to take into account in the transport of, we have to take the transport of food into account. And that creates some rather some models that can become more complicated. Here's part of the problem. Yesterday we talked about harvesting rice grass. These are the seeds that we collect by beating on them with a paddle and knocking the seeds into a, a basket. And uh, I showed you an example of calculating post-encounter return rate, right? gathering the seeds, grinding them up into a, 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 a flower. And that gave us a post-encounter return rate of 
392 calories per hour. But a, a hunter-gatherer who's out collecting these rice grass seeds is probably not going to grind them up and winnow them out out in the field. They're probably going to do that back at camp. So they're going to walk through the field gathering rice grass seeds when they have a basket full of rice grass seeds, so put the basket on, and then go back to camp. And back at camp, maybe they're going to process those seeds, or maybe they're going to hand it off to their, their, their daughter and say, grind, grind, the, grind the seeds. If somebody else is doing the work, then is, is doing that part of the work, then as far as the, the woman is concerned, the woman who gathered the seeds, her post-encounter return rate is 537 calories per hour because she's not doing the work of grinding and winnowing those, those seeds up. You see, you see what I'm saying? So you may say, okay, which return rate do you want me to use? 392 or 537. Here, I'm creating a model to use for my study of Great Basin archaeology. Which number do I use when I create a table like this? Which number am I going to put in here? I don't know. I suppose the answer is it depends. It, de it depends on what kind of question you're trying to, to uh, answer. But in this case, <coughs> it might be reasonable to think if the, uh, the children don't produce uh, as good return rates when they're foraging, then it might be even reasonable to do what you just explained, that the processing will be done by children because they have, of course, small legs and they won't be that much, so that might be one to take in the account there. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it might be that if the if a ch child's in a particular environment, if a child's return rate is so low that okay, the difference between those two is about 150 calories per hour. If the children are, can only forage at a return rate less than 150 calories per hour, it's actually better to have yeah. them do the grinding uh, and, and you just collect the seeds. Yeah. Yeah. So you can kind of take that into account of making those models as well. Because have uh, to... a good point. You could. You could do exactly that. Uh, uh, that's a good point. In, in terms of thinking about how do children become incorporated into the, the labor. Yeah. Because sometimes they are brought into the labor pool and sometimes they're not. Uh, and there's a number of variables that go into that. One is the nature of the foods. Uh, it can also be how much uh, danger children are, are in. Uh, lots of children forage a lot. And by the time they're six or seven years old, they're gathering about 50% of their calories by, by themselves. But uh, Jitwasi children don't do any foraging until they're maybe 12, 13, 14 years old. Otherwise, they're just back at camp playing. Uh, why is that? Doesn't have so much to do with the with the food resources, but um, may, it may have to do with um, how easy it is for children to get lost. The Hadza live in an environment where children can find their way back to camp uh, uh, easily. They live in an area with hills, and if children walk up, uh, you know, uh, a, a gully. If they, if they walk up that, they know that to get back to camp, all they have to do is walk downhill. The Jutwasi live in an area just sort of 
sand dunes, sand dunes, flat sand dunes, flat sand dunes. Much easier to get lost in that environment. And both of those environments, there are there are lions, along with other predators, that will uh, happily eat children. Uh, so you don't want to get lost. Uh, obviously, you don't want to spend the night away from camp in either of those environments. Lots of children can find their way back. Lots of children probably have a harder time. Uh, so that may be another variable that enters into how much danger our children our children. Are. So one of the questions we have here with central place foraging is sort of which return rate do you use? Do you use one that's that takes all the processing into account, or just the part that you might do in the field? Okay, so. What we have to think about then is how much should you process a resource out there in the field away from, from camp, out there in the forest, out in the savanna. How much should you process that food before you bring it back to camp? And this is also going to have an effect on exactly what it is that gets brought back to camp, which those are the things that will be left for archaeologists to, to find. So how do we think about that? Well, to do that, um, we need to introduce another of um, uh, the early foraging uh, models. Uh, this one's called the marginal value field. Uh, it was developed by uh, Eric Char Charnoff uh, in the late 1960s. And this, this particular theorem he, he developed for a very particular reason. He was trying to predict when would an animal that's foraging in a a patch of food, an area of food. When would the animal leave that patch to go occupy another one and start feeding there? Now he's he wasn't developing this for humans, he was developing this for fish at the time. It was the first thing. It may have been birds, I can't remember. Certainly not 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 humans. But he, but he wanted to figure out how long do you occupy a patch. But this, this model here, which is going to be very simple, has found many other uses, um, in, including one that we're going to uh, talk about. Well, we'll talk about one use here, and then we'll talk about another use uh, later on. And we'll see it again when we talk about te technology as, as well. And this is what Charnoff observed, and it's it's um, it, 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 it's completely uh, obvious. It's completely obvious. So, and this side, we've got time that an animal spends in a foraging patch. So this is when the animal first moves into the patch, then they spend time there. And you can think of that time as minutes or hours or days or even years. It, it doesn't really matter. And the more time that the forager spends in the, in the patch, the more food that they collect. This is a cumulative resource harvest. So if they spend more time there, they end up with more food. You can think of it as um, walking into a, a berry patch. And uh, it's a very nice patch full of berries, right? And you've got your little bucket, and you start picking, picking berries. Uh, I always think of blueberries, but or, or, or but you can think of it as lin linden berries. Is that right? So picking berries, picking picking berries, filling up the bucket. Uh, and in the beginning, you can pick berries very quickly. 
because they're easy to get at. So you, you acquire food fairly quickly over a short period of time. But then after a while, you've picked all the berries that are easy to get to. Now you've got to maybe get down underneath it, reach underneath the, the branches and, and, and pull the berries out. Maybe the, the berries have got um, spines on them. The, the, the branches are they're like um, some of the brambles we have in North America. I don't know what the berry patches are like here, if they have little prickers on them. Yeah, thorns on them. Uh, so it, it takes you a little bit longer to pick those berries. You've picked all the easy ones. Now you've got to sort of crawl underneath the bushes, pick, put the pail down, pick the leaves up, oh, pick the berries out like this. So you start picking them at a slower rate. Okay. So you're still acquiring some food, but the rate that you're acquiring food starts to go to go down. So you're spending more time in the patch, but your cumulative harvest, your total harvest, starts to slow down. If you insist on staying in that berry patch and picking every single berry from that patch, you'll probably stay there long enough that you'll get hungry. And you're picking berries, but you're also eating berries. And maybe now you're eating berries at a faster rate than you're picking the berries. So your cumulative harvest will actually start to go down, right? And we can imagine that if you stay there long enough, after all the berries are gone, you keep eating the berries, your cumulative rate will go back down to zero, OK? It's a very basic model that really describes the, um, the nature of resource harvesting of, of any resource, any place in the world. Very simple model. And Charnoff's question was, <coughs> at what point should a smart forager leave the patch? You're there picking berries, picking berries, picking berries. You know that down the ways there, there's another berry patch. And it, you've all done this. If you've been out picking berries in the woods, you pick berries, you pick berries, you pick berries, and then you finally go, OK, we're done here. There's still some berries, but no, no, we're done here because we're going to go down to that patch over there that no one's been to yet. And it'll be easy to pick berries there. You're balancing. What are you? What are you doing? You're balancing the cost of staying where you are and picking berries at a lower rate versus spending some time walking when you're not picking berries, walking to a new patch, and then picking berries very quickly in the new patch. You're you're balancing those off. Everyone does this not just for picking berries, but for all kinds of uh, activities. Uh, so when should you leave? This was the question Charnoff had. We know that we're, they're going to leave at some point, but when? when how, how can we predict that? So we, without going into you know, all the, the calculus involved uh, in it, what, what Charnoff uh, finally argued was that you should leave the patch when your rate of return is equivalent to the average rate of return for the wider environment taking your average travel time into account. The average time it will take you to, to travel to the next berry patch, or the next hunting patch, or the next tuber collecting patch. OK? It's the average for the environment as a whole taking travel time into account. So it's at this point when 
of, of this this line here, which it, this the slope of this line is describing the rate of return for this environment as a whole, taking travel time into into account. What you have to remember is at at each point along this curve, your the forger is experiencing a rate of return. And this is known as the instantaneous rate of return or the marginal rate of return. This is where the name marginal value here comes, comes from. Each point along that curve, the, the rate of return is equivalent to a line that's tangent to that point on the, on the curve. But at each one of those points, you're experiencing some rate of return. And as you go up this curve, that rate of return becomes lower and lower and lower until up here, it's, it's, it's zero. You're experiencing no rate of return. And then here, it becomes a negative rate of return. You're losing berries now. OK? So. You're experiencing a rate of return that's declining all the time along this, this, this curve. You move when that marginal rate of return is equivalent to the rate of return for the environment as a whole taking travel time into account. Because at that point, if you, if you forge in this patch to this point here, and then you move to a new patch, Whatever, however well you do over there, it's going to be better than you would do if you stayed in this patch. And that's exactly what, if you're out picking berries, you, you do the same, exactly the same thing. You've got some sense of where the next berry patch is. You've probably got some sense of how dense it, it will be. So you, you just sort of balance the rate of return in this berry patch versus what I can experience by walking away, walking to the next, to the next patch. You all do this. There's no, there's no mystery to it. And you're not doing it by calculating these costs and values. You're doing it just by using your own sense of berries, right? And if you have, if you if you don't go out collecting berries, then, then you won't be very good at this. You'll make mistakes. But you'll learn, and you'll get better. Uh, what, what Charnoff also found was this, this distance here, um, this, this time as is, as is measured by the, the left-hand x-axis here, is the average time to the next foraging patch. What he discovered. So yeah, that's the mean travel time between foraging uh, patches. So if you have a patch and you know what this, what that curve looks like, which you can establish through experimental work. And you know the average time to the next foraging patch. If you simply draw a line from that point to where it's tangent to this curve, then you predict how long you should stay in your current foraging patch. Now, now things get a little more complicated. The, the model you see here is really exactly the same as this. It's that, it's that model. But we've just changed some of the names of some of the, 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 the variables. And we've changed the nature of the problem. Charles' question was, how long should I stay in this patch for it? When should I move? We can think of 
processing a food resource as the same kind of decision. I've gone out and I've gathered my rice grass seeds. I can't just eat those seeds. They have to be they have to be processed. So the question is, should I process them here, out in the field, or am I am I done with my my collection? Can I now go back to camp? Should I process foods here, or should I take them back to camp? It's it's a similar kind of question. If we just think of this as the time I spend processing the food that I've already collected, how much should I process it before I say, let's go back to camp? So there are some foods that could be processed in a number of different stages. Uh, an animal, you killed an animal. Well, one option that you could have is to not process it at all. Just pick the thing up, put it across your shoulders, walk back to camp. Or I could gut the animal, dump all the, the guts out, and then pick it up and take it back to camp and not carry all those <clears throat> all those guts, <clears throat> some of which will get eaten, some of which won't. Or I could take the animal, gut it, pull all the guts out, and then I could butcher the animal out, skin it, cut it all up into pieces, and then bring the whole the pieces back to back to camp. So I, I could I could process a resource to several stages. So I could think of it as, well, here I could I could just gut it. Uh, here I could I could um, butcher it out, uh, or I could butcher it out completely so that I take no bones whatsoever back back to camp. What should you do? How much should you process a resource in the field? That has some effect on the resources posting camera return rate. And it also has an effect on what gets brought back to camp versus what gets left out at the food collection site. Okay? So, although this model is developed for one purpose, it can serve other purposes because. It's really asking you, how long should I do something before I do something else? That's really all. It's a very, very general, simple question that you ask yourself the same question, I'm sure, several times every, every, every day. It's like writing a, you know, a doctoral dissertation. How, how long should I work on this before I say, no, I'll go do something, something else? So we've got the same model here. Um, if we've got time spent collecting and processing a food, we can see that the, the in, in this case, our vertical axis, instead of being cumulative return, is really the, the utility of the load that I'm going to carry back uh, to camp. Let me, just a second here. Yeah, let me, let me just jump ahead to this one. So, so, so we have an example to think about here. Uh, the, the, this is, these pictures are of uh, pinyon pine, pine nuts. And these were, uh, in the western United States, pinyon pine nuts were a very important uh, food, especially a very important winter food, uh, for the hunter-gatherers who lived in the far western United States, especially in the, the Great Basin in Nevada and parts of uh, Utah. Uh, they're a really interesting um, a food resource because it takes them two years uh, to, to grow. Instead of just one year, it takes two years. 
for these pine cones to, to grow, which means that at any time, if I could take you out to Nevada, I could take you to a, a pinyon pine tree, and we could look at it. Let's see, this is March. I could tell you by looking at the old pine cones, I could tell you how good last year's harvest was. By looking at the young green pine, I could tell you how good the harvest will be this fall. Usually you collect these in September. I could tell you how good the harvest will be in this September of 2014. And by looking at the little buds on the branches, I could tell you how good or how bad the harvest will be in September of 2015. Because it takes two years for those things to grow. At any one time, you can put see last year's, this year's, and next year's uh, uh, harvest. Uh, to uh, harvest them, the Shoshone and the, the Paiute people uh, would collect them. They had several different ways of, of collecting them. But they would usually spread something underneath the tree. This picture was taken in the 1950s. So she spread some, probably some old um, blankets or bed sheets underneath the tree. You could you could put woven mats underneath the, tr the tree. And she's reaching up with a long, very long stick that has a, a hook on the end. And she'll reach up into there around one of these pine cones and then just kind of snap it off the branch with a quick jerk. You can pop these off the, off the branch. And it'll fall down uh, onto this, this sheet. Um, so now you've got the pine cone with all the little seeds inside of it there. You could just pick up those pine cones and fill your basket up. They used baskets. They're round baskets about this bit round and about this high, and they were conical shaped. You could pick up those pine cones, but and fill them up in your basket and put your basket on and go home. Would you do that? No. Why not? It's, uh, you can get more. Right? A little, little bit more. You're carrying a lot of waste yeah. in that because the, you can't eat any of the pine cones, so yeah. you, you're, you're carrying a lot of waste uh, in there. Um, so the utility of that load is not very high because you've got a full basket, that's all you can carry. But how much food value is in there? Well, not, not so much, because a lot of the volume is taken up with this useless pine, pine cone. So we can take the pine cones, and if you collect them when they're dry like that, really all you have to do is just kind of crunch them. You can do it in your, in your hands, just crunch them. Uh, or sometimes they would put them on rocks and just pound them with, with rocks and <coughs> shake the, the seeds out of it. Throw the pine cone away. Keep, keep, keep doing that. Pounding one, shake the seeds out of it. And this is what you'll be left with, our pinyon pine seeds. Each of those seeds has a little a hard shell on it. Which, which humans can't, can't eat. So the pie would get rid of those by putting them on <coughs> a flat grinding stone, a, a, a matate, uh, and then taking another stone here, a mono, and just kind of gently going like that and breaking those hulls up. You then put them in a basket like this, and uh, this woman is, she's just winnowing the, the hulls out by tossing the seeds up in the air. The wind blows the hulls away, and she's left with the, the, the seeds, just, just the seeds. And those are, those are edible as they are. You can just eat those. I've eaten plenty of them. Uh, what could then be done with them? Um, these were often stored for the winter. 
So, and they would store them. To store them for the winter, you have to, you have to roast them. So they would put those seeds back in this tray and put some coals from a fire in there and then just kind of roll them around for about 10 minutes or so. Roll it around, roll it around. You have to roll it around because otherwise the coals will burn through the basket. So you have to keep rolling it around and rolling it around. And you, you, you parch those seeds. You, you, you just cook them a little, a little bit. And then you can store them for um, a long time. Uh, or you can take them and grind them up into a flour and make flour out of them, mix it with water, bake it as a bread, or cook it in pottery and use it as a thickener for, for soups. So there's several, there's a few stages here in preparing pin, pinyon. You have to, you can remove the seeds from the cone and then you can remove the hulls off of the seeds to get the seeds. Then you can parch them in trays and then maybe grind them up into flour. So there's several stages that you can put pinion through in order to make it uh, edible, in order to use it. So the question is, you're a Shoshone, man or woman. You're out collecting pinion nuts, uh, pinion seeds, or technically seeds, um, up in the mountains. Your camp is, I don't know, five kilometers away. What should you do? How much should you process the pinion pine seeds? Uh, I would probably process the uh, stages that, you know, that get rid of, get rid of the excess material like that, uh, getting rid of the, 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 the cone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That one is for that, those second stages uh, that you can, uh, that doesn't, uh, there's not much weight in that. That other stuff that gets removed from the, the yeah. several stages that are coming after that. So I, I just do the first stage and then carry those and do that in camp. Yeah, you'd make a good Shoshone <laughs> because that's probably what we've actually calculated the numbers for for this. And if you're going to transport pinion more than about um, a uh, hundred meters, you should take it out of the pine cone. It's it's worth it. Only a hundred meters. But if to take it out of the hull, to spend the time taking it out of the hull, you have to transport that pinion. I think it was. I think the number we came up with is uh, 80 kilometers. If you're going to transport that pinion 80 kilometers, then you should take it out of the hull. Otherwise, it's not it's not worth it. Doing the parching, doing the grinding, none of that should be done out where you're gathering the pinion, unless you're camping right yeah. right there. That that will be done back at a, a camp. Yeah, and when you need kind of heavy tools to do that, why would you carry yes. them? Yes. Yeah. yeah, you do need. <laughs> they are heavy tools. Mm -hmm. uh, I can assure you they're heavy because We've collected them out in the mountains and carried them back with us. They are heavy. <laughs> um, so that's all that this model is is doing, is, is asking us. We know that as we process our pinyon, the utility of a load of a basket full of food is going to go up. If we transport, if we just remove, if we if we don't remove the uh, seeds from the cone, our, our, our the, the utility of our load is fairly low. If we remove the seeds from the cone, our, our utility goes up. But if we remove the holes off the seeds, the utility is also going to go up, but not by very much. Not by very much. 
And there's always a trade-off. Everything in uh, evolution and everything in these models is a trade-off. I wonder if you define that word, trade-off. Do I? I had a very hard time. When I, when I taught in Argentina a couple years ago, we had a very difficult time translating the word trade-off into Spanish. Trade-off is if I do this, then I can't do this. Intercambio. Huh? Intercambio. Intercambio might. I think that might have been the. That's I don't think. I don't think. I think that was the word that we decided to use. Intercambio. Yeah. Trade off. If you trade something. No, no. And you're 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 not actually trading no. something for something. You have to make a decision between two things. I can do this or I can do this. But if I do this, I can't do this. If I do this, I can't do this. Which do you want to do? You're trading the other one for the other one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Choosing between the two. The parents give this choice to children all the time. You can do this or this, but you can't do both. Right? That's all terms. It's, it's an alternative, so you have to decide which one you're going to do. So if I spend my time removing the, the hulls from these pinion seeds, that takes a lot of time. It doesn't increase the utility of my load very much. And that's time that I could be spending collecting more pine cones and, and getting the seeds out of them, which is very quick, very, very quick activity. So it's a, but it's a trade-off. I can't do both at the same time. So you can remove the hulls, or you can be gathering more pinion seeds. It's, it's a, it's a trade-off. And in this case, the, the answer is probably pretty obvious. Yes, I'll, removing the hulls doesn't do much for me, but spending that time, that hour or whatever, gathering more pinion gets me a lot more food, right? So it's, that's what we mean by trade-off. Well, I don't know how to, can you put it into Finnish, in the account view? We'll go through Spanish. It's in Spanish, alternative. Alternatives. Alternatives. Yeah. yeah. Two alternatives. But a trade-off implies you can't do both. This one or this one. But you can't buy. Okay. Uh, someday I have to make a whole list of how to translate trade off into all these different languages. Um, so, time spent. Processing a food in the field is time that you're not spending gathering more of that resource in the field. So there's a there's a, a decision to be made there. At the same time, processing the food can increase the utility of the load that you're going to carry. You don't want to carry a lot of waste. But it's time you're not going to spend collecting more of that of that food. I mean, we can think of it in terms of animals as well. I could sit here and completely butcher out this this animal I've just killed, or I could be going on to look for another animal. I have to decide where to put that for that time. So that, that's what this model is trying to figure out. And Obviously, one of the obvious variables that's controlling it is how long is it back to camp. If it's a very short distance to camp, then there may not be any purpose to increasing my the utility of my load. If I'm camped just 50 meters from the, the pinyon trees, 
But I camp just 50 meters from pinyon trees. There's no reason to process, to even take these out of the, the cone. I'll just fill my basket up, walk 50 meters, dump it, tell the kids, take care of that. And then I'll go back and get some more pine cones. No sense in me wasting my time breaking these cones open. When 50 meters away, I can be asking my kids, my sister, my mother to do it. You know, for, for me. I'll spend my time just getting more of the, the food to do no processing. That has an effect on what the, the, the post-encounter return rate actually is. Uh, and it has an effect on what ends up in, in camp. So that becomes important, travel time to the next camp. Just as in the this model, it's our time to our next foraging patch. It's the same model, it's the same process, but we simply are changing the variable to the round trip travel time back to, to camp. In this case, it's a round trip travel time because we figure somebody's collecting food, bringing it back to camp, dropping it off, going back to get, to get more. So it's the round, the round trip. Uh, so, if we don't process the, the food, we can operate at one return rate. If we process the food, we're operating at a slightly lower return rate, but we're increasing the utility of, of the load. How do we decide when we should process or when we shouldn't? Well, the, the curve we had here, we, we were treating this time spent collecting and processing as if it were a continuous process. That's the way Eric Charnoff originally thought about it, because in fact, if you're out collecting a resource from a field, picking berries, picking berries, it's a, it's a, it's a more or less continuous process. But if you process a resource, it's a staged process because you're either going to do it or not. It's not a continuous process. It's a, it's a stepped function. You either process or you don't process. So instead of this being a continuous function, it's actually a set of linear functions. And I've just put two in here, but we could have drawn a third and a fourth one uh, 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 into there. So how do we know, how can we figure it, it, it out? This, this point here is without processing. Okay, this is just, this is an abstract model, okay, so we can define it however we want. This is the point without pro processing. You're operating at some rate up here. This is the, the, the rate we're operating with if we process the food resource. This, the, the slope of the line connecting these two points is the, the rate of return we should ex at, at which we should process the food resource. If we simply extend that line out, we define a point Z and this is the, the round trip travel time that we should experience if, we sh if, if we're going to need to process the resource. That is, if our round trip travel time is less than Z, we shouldn't waste time processing the resource. We should just gather up basket loads of it, bring it home, dump it, go get, go get more. But if the camp is further away than Z, we should process the food resource. So the whole question in here is, how do we calculate Z? How do we calculate this distance here? Because that's, that's the distance at which we should then process 
that food is theirs. Now, as, if you were a hunter-gatherer, you, would, you wouldn't do the algebra. You would have a gut sense. It's uh, so far back to camp. We should take the pinion out of the cones and just take the seeds back to camp. It's, it's, it's too far. You would be calculating this. You're indeed calculating in your brain, but you're not doing it with the actual algebra. So how can we do this? Well, we can do it really by looking at the slope of this, of this line. This variable here is the time we spend collecting and processing a food. If, if we're not, if we're not going to process it very far, and this this value here is the amount of time we spend collecting and processing some food to some stage, to some level of of of, uh, of, of, of process. We're going to process it to some stage. This variable is a, our measure of how useful the load is if we don't process the resource. And y sub 1 here is the utility of a load if we do process the resource. The utility goes up if we spend time processing the resource. It's a trade-off. You get greater load utility, but you have to spend more time in the field to acquire it. The slope of this line is the rise over the run, right? Vertical rise over the horizontal run. So we can define that as the rise, y sub o, over z plus x sub o. Or the same line has a slope of y sub 1, the rise, over the run, z plus x sub 1, right? So the slope of the line, these are two ways to express the slope of the line. y sub o over z plus x sub o equals y sub 1 over z plus x sub 1, because it's the same line. It's that black line there. Right? So then we just have to take that equation and solve for z. And that's it. That solves for z. So all we have to do is plug the numbers in here, and we can calculate z. It'll tell us how long the round trip should be at, at how long a round trip has to be before we should process the resource. Okay. So that's a very easy equation. The only hard part is calculating all those numbers that go into it. Just to remind you what they are. They're the time we spend collecting a resource without processing it the time we spend collecting and processing a resource, for example, collecting pinyon and um, taking it out of the, the, pine, the pine cones. This is the utility of the load if we don't process the food, and this is the utility of the load if we do process the food. Those, those numbers can all be acquired. I mean, we can do it uh, 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 we can do it from ethnographic data if, if we have people doing the appropriate things in their part of their real life, or we can calculate them from experimental uh, work. So for Pinon, for example, there's a there are some archaeologists uh, working in Nevada and Utah who have gone out, they've collected pinon, they've figured out how much pinon can I collect in you know, X amount of, of time, just like with the rice grass seeds. And then they've taken aboriginal baskets. They actually took the biggest 
Aboriginal baskets they could find in uh, uh, the museum in uh, Utah, and figured out how much pinion can we put in that basket if we just put the pine cones in. How much pinion can we put in that basket if we crunch the seeds and take the seeds out and put them in the, in the basket? It's all just done uh, experimentally. But the, the, the variables can be a little tough to figure out, but um, it can be done. It can be, it can be done. And we can start calculating how, how much should you process a resource in the field depending on how far it is that you have to go back to, to camp. And that, as I said, that affects what the posting counter return rate is. That affects what actually gets taken back to, to camp. This can be really useful. Um, years ago, uh, those of you who are in the lithics um, uh, lectures, I, I talked a little bit about the Carson Desert uh, in western uh, Nevada, in the western United States. Uh, and th th there's a wetland down on the valley floor, and we excavated some sites there. Up in the mountains are, is uh, pinon trees. And one of the questions we had was, were the people on the valley floor going up into the mountains and collecting food resources and bringing those back down to the valley floor? We, we wanted to know that. So one food resource they could collect up there is, is pinion. So how would we know if they were collecting pinion in the mountains when they're living down on the valley floor. The distance from the sites on the valley floor to the pinon is about 30 kilometers. So we, at the right about the same time, people were working on these, these models. And one of the things the models said was, if you're going to transport pinon, um, you should always take it out of the pine cone. You should never be transporting pine cones, unless the camp is li literally less than 100 meters away. But if it's more than 100 meters, take the seeds out of the pine, the pine cone. But you don't take the, the hulls off the, off the seed. Don't waste your time doing that. Spend that time collecting more pinyon. Pin, pin so we knew that if people were going into the mountains, and collecting pinyon and bringing it down to the valley floor. They should bring down pinyon seeds that have the holes on them. And that means we should find the holes of those seeds in the hearths and the other flotation samples that we ran. Uh, preservation was very good in these sites. We had really very very good pre pre preservation in the in the hearts we did not find a single pinion uh, hull not not even one but if they were bringing pinion the models suggest they should have brought those hulls into the camp we found none so that allows us to come to the conclusion that they were not going up into the mountains to collect uh, uh, pinyon, pinyon holes. Now, we could work out the same model with uh, large, large game. Uh, you can go up into those mountains and hunt uh, bighorn sheep. They, they live up there today, and they've lived up there in the past as well, because we've excavated sites in the mountains, and they have bighorn sheep bones uh, in them. Did people go up and hunt those animals? This is a little hard for us to say because the models suggest if you're going to transport meat from sheep in the mountains down to the valley floor, you would 
almost certainly butcher the animal out entirely, strip the meat off, dry it, and bring back basket loads of dried meat. No bones at all. And we found no sheep bones in these sites down on the valley floor. Does that mean they were not they were not hunting sheep? I can't say that for certain. Because if they were hunting sheep in the mountains, I don't expect them to bring any any bones back. So we can't we, we just can't say anything con conclusive uh, about, the skins. about that. They bring the skins. Oh they 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 might bring the skins back. They almost certainly would bring well, I know that one. I thought maybe the, maybe the, the, you know, the, Yeah, we didn't find any of those out there. No. Uh, and I was there a hooved animal, so I'd actually expect them to, to cut it around yeah. the radius ulna and the tibias and strip it off. Um, I wouldn't expect those to come back. But, but nobody's sort of figured that out, and it's a little harder to figure out, too. So, uh, yeah. These. Uh, these are known as, as transport models, and they, they, some of them have been worked out. There's still plenty of, of work left uh, to be done, but they can be a very important and useful model for understanding what it is that's um, helping us to figure out what we would expect to find in an archaeological site uh, if people were taking a, some kind of, of, of resource. Because the evidence we'll find in the site depends on how much they process that resource in the field. And that turns out to be something that we can predict. We can, we can predict. Um, and we used a very simple model here, just looking at uh, this model basically assumes don't process, process. But the models could become a lot more complicated because you can normally process a resource to several stages. So we could process it to stage one, or stage two, or stage three. And the further down we want to process it, we would only do that if the travel time back to camp becomes further and further away. So these models could become really pretty, pretty, pretty complicated. If we wanted to go there. Question. Of course, this is based on calories and energy, but could you kind of uh, use this similar model of this to like uh, some uh, materials other than food resources, like maybe lipids? Lipids, yeah. Yeah, people have thought about uh, about it. you can think about this instead of foraging for food, you can think of this as quarrying rock. So how far should you process that rock down before you transport it uh, away? Uh, and and it's, the, it's a similar problem, uh, because to, it, it, it depends on the nature of the quarry. But you can remove a lot of useless rock. Um, that, that you don't want to transport because it, it's, it's the outside of cobbles and they're eroding. Um, the, the sun has been working on them. They've dried out is the term we use. Uh, and you can remove all of that to get the inside of the rock, which is still, which is still usable. Um, it, 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 ar some archaeologists in North America have thought about that. They've started to work with these models, but nobody's really carried them a long way. And, and part of that is because we, we've been uncertain how to measure the utility of, of, of rock. Uh, um, and we have to do a lot of experimental work on, on quarrying a stone, which uh, very few people have done. There's a little bit of research on it. Very few people experimented with quarrying stone using Aboriginal methods. 
it's a lot of work. The people who have done it can tell you it's a lot of work. Uh, but absolutely, you could use these models to talk about um, the uh, uh, how, how much you should process a lipid resource before you transport it. Scary. <laughs>